up guys this is pete clark welcome to the carrot poker podcast episode 81 i cut off the music a little bit abruptly there um i'd gone on too long the singing almost started we can't have one podcast out of 81 where the singing goes you know at the start it's only meant to be at the end so we're going to talk a little bit more about gto today we're going to do another pio solution and we're going to look at the complete opposite of what we looked at last time we did this um a couple of episodes ago i think it was episode 78 perhaps something like that don't quote me on it we looked at dry king high boards we saw that the button razor in that spot or the small line razor i don't quite remember which was doing a lot of c betting and then doing a lot of over betting on the turn with a more polarized range so c betting flop with a high frequency because we were doing very well on the king high board and wanted to protect equity and push the equity of our range to force our opponent to fold more than the math would suggest due to the unequal ranges, unequal ranges. Go back and watch that if you're not sure what I'm talking about. That's a few episodes ago. If you are up to date on that episode, I'll assume that you are, um, we're going to talk about the opposite today, which is 10 of diamonds, 8 of diamonds, 7 of diamonds. Diamonds are a particularly obnoxious suit. Um, I don't know why, I just don't like them. So when the board comes down three diamonds, it's much worse than when it comes down three of another suit, right guys? But back to serious technical content, we're going to be exploring today how the button is going to play a vastly different strategy on 1087 monotone than he played on the king whatever whatever dry and the reasons for that. And I'm going to also debunk one of the biggest myths that there is about c betting the flop in game theory and today there's about a 95% chance that you believe this myth and you're about to learn that the completely intuitive conclusions that some people draw about a monotone board are completely wrong, like they couldn't be further from the truth. Before we get into the specifics of this flop and before I start taking you guys through the pile sim that I've built here, what I'm going to do is actually explain two concepts in general. They are firstly range advantage, i.e. equity advantage, and secondly nut advantage, i.e. equity advantage, when we zoom in on the very best hands possible for each player. So range advantage is looking at the whole range overall, and nut advantage is looking at who has more of the hands that win an incredibly high frequency of the time, and are just massively plus EB. Range advantage is a function of equity. It comes from who has more big pairs, who has more two pair, who has more top pair, who has more nutted draws, um, things like that. And on a flop like 10, 8, 7 of diamonds, the range advantage is going to be pretty neutralized. Um, the button is not going to be boasting that much of an equity advantage anymore. But generally, um, the higher the equity advantage of the preflop raiser, the more often he's going to be c betting and that's because the more equity that that player has the more that they can get away with it essentially and the big blind the player on the defense here is going to have to fold more than the what's called the minimum defense you can see for that player would suggest that means that when button bets one half of the pot for example not a bet size i use a lot but just for talking sake the big blind would normally have to defend two thirds of his range to stop the button from printing money with any two cards. The reason for this is that the button is risking one unit to win two and therefore has a required fold equity percentage of 33 or 34, depending on which way you are inclined with that. So normally if ranges were equal and position was equal and there weren't any complicating factors, the player in the big blind would seek to defend 66 or 67% of his range in order to negate the idea that the button could bluff with any two cards that would be a very bad thing if ranges were equal however ranges are not equal and that's why we saw in the last hand where ranges were very unequal that the button was going to see bet at a way higher frequency um, than a gt than than he would if ranges were equalized and the reason for that is that the big blind was going to fold at a way higher frequency than the math would suggest because of the inequalities in range and position that the big blind was suffering against the button so the more equalization that happens on a flop, that's to say the more the big blind player, who's always going to have an equity disadvantage against the button, that's just the way it goes. He has a weaker range. Pot odds are enticing him into the pot at a higher frequency than they would in any other position by far. So the big blind player is going to be forced to play a lot of weak hands. He's going to be also forced by pre-flop game theory 
two, three bet his very best hands for value and build the pot before the flop. So he's going to be mostly devoid of those. And therefore, on any flop texture at all, it could be the worst, wettest, most horrible board in the world for the button. The button is still going to have an advantage. It is a massive fallacy that on some low board that the big blind is actually going to have the advantage. That is not true. It's false, guys. It's nonsense. Don't believe that. When you hear people say, oh, the four and the seven and the deuce are like so in his range, I can't do anything. Just tell them they're wrong. Yes, the guy can hit more one pair than you, but you have a lot bigger better cards and bigger better over pairs pocket pairs than he has so you're still going to have a range advantage so there is no board where equity gets completely equalized to the point that it's 50 50 or better for the big blind but in some of the cases where the equalization is the most extreme the big blind almost catches up to the button's equity and this is one of these cases the rule for equity though is that the more of it you have the more betting you want to do to capitalize on the fact that your opponent has to quote unquote overfold, he has to fold more of his range than the math would suggest due to the inequalities. This isn't making sense. Go back and watch the first installment of this kind of solving series that I did and it may make more sense or go and listen to a more beginner based podcast. Bam. Just kidding guys. Um, so if we look at nut advantage, the other one of the factors that we need to consider in a spot like this, we'll find that the nut advantage is very equalized. That's to say that on 10, 8, 7, all diamonds, the over pairs and even top set that the button normally sort of lauds over the big blind here and sort of uses as his unique hands that he can have and only he can have, these no longer do anything for him because they're not very good. No one likes to have ace of clubs, ace of spades on 10, 8, 7, all diamonds. It's not a particularly high EV hand anymore. What do we like to have on 10, 8, 7, all diamonds? We like to have the ace of diamonds, the king of diamonds, but even better, a flush. Now, both players have a lot of combos of offsuit ace of diamonds, even though we have a bit more as the button, he still has some. And when it comes to flushes, he probably has some flushes that we don't even have because he had to call jack three suited sometimes out of the big blind through a small open and we weren't opening that from the button. So he may even have, have more flushes across the board. We probably have more nut flushes so if you want to go to the very top of the tree here and look at the very best creme de la creme hands, we're going to have more of like the nut flushes. But when I say nut advantage here, I'm not talking about just the nut flush. I'm talking about the category of flushes per se, which is a very, very strong category. Having a flush blocks your opponent from having one or even having a flush draw. And it's just going to be an immensely powerful high EV hand on 10, 8, 7 all diamonds. So the blue cards here, the diamonds are really the only ones that matter when it comes to the nuts. Therefore, the nut advantage is split evenly, and therefore, we don't want to do what we do when we have a big nut advantage, like when our over pairs are really, really, really strong and bet massive. We actually want to bet small. So, in summary, when it comes to the general concepts here, equity advantage controls betting frequency, and nut advantage controls bet sizing, both in a directly proportionate way, where if, what, where if one is higher, the other is also higher. On 10, 8, 7, there is no real equity advantage. If we look at the equity advantage of in position there, it's only going to be 52.601% in the seven that I've done there. That's not very big. It's only slightly more than half. Most of the really high EV hands are also shared by both players. That takes us on to nut advantage. If we look at that, we see that the EV for in position here is only going to be 35 into a pot of 59. That is more than half. Like I said, the button does have the equity and EV advantage on pretty much any texture against the big blind. That's just his role is to have that due to the uncappedness of his range. But on this board, it's very, very slight and the big blind is equalized a lot. So here comes the biggest debunk of the century in poker, perhaps. Don't quote me on it. The button here wants to bet a low frequency. I think we knew that already. He doesn't love his flop. There's no reason to bet all of the time on a flop where you don't have a big advantage. If you want to understand that idea better, imagine posting a big blind. You do that when ranges are equal. Every player has every possible hand at the start of a hand of no limit hold'em. We don't like posting a big blind. Therefore, it's not good to just randomly put money in with your whole range when you don't have a range advantage. Therefore, button wants a, sorry, I said that in the really Scottish way, button button, 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 wants a very small betting frequency here of only 50-ish percent, which is very small for an imposition preflop raiser. Usually an imposition preflop raiser is gonna to want to bet a lot more often than that, but he's not here. 
Secondly, the nut advantage is not really in Button's favour, and here it comes. Because of that, the sizing recommended by a solver in this spot, 1087 all diamonds for the Button, is a small size exclusively, it's only one third pot. Is that earth shattering news? Not to people who have studied extensive game theory and understand how nut advantage controls bet sizing. However, it's more groundbreaking for people who look at that board 1087 and fall into the very automatic trap of just thinking, that board is wet, I want to pile money into the pot and protect my equity and stop Villain from drawing that, that dreaded argument about him having flush draws and that dreaded obsession with him having flush draws and it becoming the be-all and end-all of the beginner's thought process. We coaches, we hate this. We're subjected to this day in, day out, all the time, people obsessing over a flush draw. Put it this way, if you have a hand like pocket jacks here and your opponent has a hand like king queen with the king of diamonds you're flipping basically he's not folding two over cards with a flush draw he's not folding a pair with a flush draw he's not folding any of these hands that have loads of equity against you if the turn happens to bring a fourth diamond you should be happy that you didn't put more money into the pot with jacks not sad because you weren't getting him off that really high equity hand the breakdown in logic where a student thinks that on a soaking wet board he has to use only big bets comes in the form of him assuming that his opponent will actually fold something that has loads of equity, which is not the case. The value that you get by betting jacks against king-queen with a diamond is extremely thin because you're basically flipping with that hand. It's not even really value at all. If anything, that hand does an advantage because it makes more nutted hands than you do. It has similar equity to you. So... We don't want to do a lot of betting and we don't want to make big bets in the spot. We want, we want to make small bets. So to summarize, Pyle's betting 1087 button versus big blind with 52% of his range and exclusively with 19 into 59, the one third pot size bet. What hands are betting more often? Well, this strategy is polarized. Here we go debunking another myth, which is that the polarized range has to use a big sizing. No, it doesn't. Usually it uses a big sizing because it's on the turn or it's on the river, and Villain's range is a little bit more capped now, because he's not raised us on the flop, and therefore we're piling on pressure with the uncapped hands against the capped hands, much like we saw the pre-flop raiser do last time on the Dry King high board, where it was safe to do that. 1087 is the opposite. Yes, we want a polarized selective betting strategy here as the button. We don't want to bet very often with A7 offsuit with no diamond, that would be terrible. But what we do want to do is just basically polarize and mainly bet with very good hands especially those that need protection so we'll see a lot of betting here when we hold a hand such as king nine of diamonds we'll do that for value we will check that hand sometimes though because when you're forced to check a lot you also need to protect your checking range so in these monotone boards it may surprise you to know that a hand like ace king of diamonds is almost always played as a check when i say almost always i mean 73 percent of the time why are we checking back the nuts because we block a lot of his calling range, we need to put some flushes in our check back range and one of the best ones to put in there is the one that makes it hard to get called. When we have the ace and king of diamonds, it's hard to get action by betting on this flop, it's not impossible. But if we do check, we can make up for lost ground later. And here's another thought, if Villain had a strong hand that was gonna call multiple bets, he's gonna lead the turn, we're gonna raise, or he's gonna check raise the turn and we're gonna get loads of money in anyway. Against a player that's not an unbelievable passive net, you're going to get loads of money into the pot anyway with a hand like Ace King of Diamonds on the later streets. You want to give your opponent the chance to bluff. I would say against Population, and this is very much in the style of my series Pio versus Population, check it out on CarrotCorner.com. First episode is half price, it's four episodes. It teaches you how solvers play against the pool. Um, and against the pool, we really want to be considering how they play. And I do think that people will fail to bluff enough on the turn and river for really big bets if we check behind this flop. Therefore, there probably is an argument for betting Ace King of Diamonds more often than just 25% of the time like the solver's doing here. Um, there's probably an argument for betting it most of the time against pool, but in theory, against a pool that will bluff you enough on the turn if you check back, that hand goes very well as a bluff catcher and does very well for just raising later. So if we do check back the flop here and then the turn comes to deuce of clubs, the ultimate brick, villain leads out at us um we are actually just calling a race king because most of the hands that he leads for value he's going to lead again on the river because he's polarized and most of the ones that he bluffs with he is going to keep bluffing with many of them so we call there and we actually wait till the river on a monotone board to do a lot of our raising with a hand like that 
which is very different to how it would be on many other boards. The reason for that is the board is very, very defined already. It's very set in stone. There's three diamonds there already. It is what it is. So if we do check back the flop with the nut flush here with the ace, king, and diamonds, the villain bets turn into the two of clubs and we call. Board is 10, 8, 7, deuce. River's the three of hearts. So board is 10 of diamonds, 8 of diamonds, 7 of diamonds, deuce of clubs, three of hearts. And villain then bets the river. We are going to suddenly wake up and raise for value. So that's how that hand is playing for the most part. It's checking back flop, calling turn, raising river. It's the ultimate slow play, I guess you could say. But it makes a lot of sense. Because what this hand does not want to do is leave our checking range completely exploitable and vulnerable. On that note, what does population have when they check back the flop on 10, 8, 7 all diamonds? Have a think about it in your car right now if you're driving. Pause the podcast if you're at home. Think about it. That's right. If you've thought about it, I'll go ahead and tell you. Spoiler alert. They have nothing. At 5 NL, 10 NL, 25 NL, 50 NL, 100 NL, 200 NL, NL online in tough games, they still usually have nothing. This is one of the most poorly balanced, poorly executed spots you're going to see in the pool. And at the micro stakes, you can probably lead the turn with any two cards and make an enormous profit. It doesn't mean that you should because some hands have higher checking EV than betting EV. But for hands that need to bluff, I would recommend leading the turn like a maniac every time your opponent checks back this flop because all you need to do is take one quick look at Pio to see how far they are playing from the GTO solution. Let's have a look at branches where we bet the flop and talk a bit more about what hands we want to bet on the flop. So when Villain checks to us as the big blind on 10 7 all diamonds, we're incentivized to bet 100% of the time with the pocket jacks. There are two things about jacks that make that a 100% bet or close to it. The first is the vulnerability of the hand, the fact that there are lots of overcards to that hand and it wants to get protection from them. The second is that that hand wants to go ahead and build the pot a bit more because it has more nut potential, it has a straight draw as well as just an overpair. So Jax is going to bet all the time, sets are going to bet all the time pretty much with some small slow play frequency but not much. A hand like Ace-10 is going to bet an incredibly high frequency, again very vulnerable. Hands such as Ace-Queen, these are going to mix bluffing and, and checking back. And you might think that they're just going to bet when they have a diamond, but actually some of your better bluffs here, believe it or not, are hands that just don't contain a diamond because these hands unblock hands that your opponent can call and then fold later, like single diamond hands. And these hands also are good for bluffing sometimes when the turn comes a diamond or the river comes a diamond. You want to have, in theory, some hands on a monotone board that you can continue to bluff with even when the diamond draw gets there. You don't want to fall into the very, very easy and obvious trap of just always betting all your diamond hands as bluffs and never betting any of your non-diamonds. If we look at a hand like ace-queen off here, ace of spades, queen of hearts, for example, it's betting 52.2% of the time. That's huge when our range is only betting half the time. Another example of a hand that wants to bet really often here is a bluff that no one ever bets is like deuces without a diamond. Why is this hand doing so much betting? Well, one, it's like the most vulnerable pair you can ever get. Two, we can't really like only bluff diamond hands. We do want to bluff some under pairs that can get folds from better hands, like pocket fives. And three, it has two clean outs to a set that when we get called will usually make us the best hand. And the set does not complete any straights here. It does complete a flush, but we can live with that. We have redraw against flushes. And he doesn't always have to have a diamond when he calls flop, of course. So the strategy here is to bet a lot of hands that are vulnerable, that are bluffing, whether or not they have a diamond, we still want some bluffs that don't. We do definitely want to bluff hands like Ace-8 with the Ace of Diamonds quite frequently as well. Sorry, that's a pair. Ace-5 with Ace of Diamonds. We want to do that almost always. Ace-4 without the Ace of Diamonds. These hands on 10 8, 7 needless to say, don't have really any showdown value and they want to bluff with the nut potential of the nut flush draw. Hands we don't want to bet would be hands that are the opposite of the jacks. So hands that have worse value that can't really value bet. Um, and therefore don't want to protect their equity on a soaking wet board and also don't have much redraw to the nuts. So a hand such as King 7 of hearts on 10 8, 7 this is a very good example of a hand that is just going to check. It's not good often enough to protect its equity. By betting, it's just going to try and like slither its way to showdown in one piece and hope to win. That's very much going to be the role of a hand like King 7. When we get past the flop, so let's say that we have bet small on the flop, we'll follow this branch for a second, and villain has called 
First off, what should Villain raise us with here? He should actually raise us pretty damn polar because we were really selective about what we bet the flop with. We tried to avoid betting too too many of our medium hands. We're betting a lot of flushes. We're betting a lot of sets. We're betting some good over pairs that were vulnerable. We're betting some top pair. We were bluffing. We weren't betting that many random medium strength hands, especially without a diamond. So Villain's raising strategy on the flop is going to be very straightforward. It's going to be polar. He's going to bluff sometimes with a hand like King-9 off with a diamond, of course. And he's going to value raise in that flush. And he's going to value raise some king high flushes. But he's not going to raise many low flushes here in GTO. The reason for that is that they become thin. Maybe not right now, but when the pot starts growing and the turn bricks and the river bricks, we call a turn bet as well, him having like, I don't know, let's say a bad flush such as jack five of diamonds, that hand is not going to want to put tons of money into the pot, or at least it's going to want to protect his, his calling range. This is another board where Villain doesn't want to just like completely cap himself when he calls flop because the nuts are just too staring you in the face apparent dominating hands are just like defined their diamonds that's it so Villain wants to put some flushes in his calling range as well it's a bit of a more advanced concept I won't go into it in too much detail but like the more the more amazingly powerful the nutted hands the more important it can be to keep your calling range uncapped against the range that bets Anyway, I digress. So he's going to be only raising the flop here in Pio 11% of the time. The big blind here, usually continuing by calling. Calling 60% here, so overfolding slightly. Well, he's folding 30% here, so he's overfolding slightly against our small bet because he is out of position with an equity advantage and a nutted disadvantage. Equity disadvantage, not disadvantage. Just that those are quite minor here. That's what makes us behave on the button but he does fold a little bit more than the math would suggest. The math would say if we bet one third of the pot, he needs to continue 75% of the time because 25% is our break even point with fold equity. If he folds 25%, a random bluff breaks even. So he needs to make a random bluff not do very well. So he needs to call in theory 75% here, but he's only calling or raising 70% here, raising 10, calling 60. And the reason for that is he's out of position with a little bit of a disadvantage. But on this flop, Villain comes a lot closer to meeting that mathematical defense frequency that presupposes equal ranges than he would on the Dry King high board that we looked at before, where we saw that he overfolds dramatically. So the reason for that is equalization. So when he continues, he's usually calling. The stuff Big Blind is going to fold on 10, 8, 7 is kind of obvious. It's stuff like King 5 of hearts and Ace 4 of spades and like the stuff that is so dead that you could just never envision winning the pot in a million years without bluffing and we tend not to want to bluff with completely dead hands when we're check raising an uncapped polarized c-bank range. So he's going to be folding most of his stuff here um, that is dead, calling with some mediocre stuff like a pair of eights, a pair of sevens, a pair of tens, calling with some weak flushes, calling with some pair plus draw, raising with some king of diamonds blocker, queen of diamonds blocker, ace of diamonds blocker bluffs um, and raising some weirder bluffs like 7-5 of spades that is like a little bit too bad to call on 10-8-7 all diamonds but blocks some sets in two pair and is going to make an okay raise because it can hit trip sevens I mean we don't have a lot of non-diamond hands to bluff with that are good here so we do want to bluff some that don't hit the jack the nine the diamond turn that's where the 7-5 of spades or the pocket pocket pairs aren't really raising here but something like um the bottom pair, the middle pair, um, that are occasionally bluffing here. Not very often, but like there's some frequency of like a weird seven bluffing here. Check raising. So yeah, big blind is gonna gonna defend close to the minimum defense frequency here in a relatively equal spot. If he does call and we get a blank turn, the interesting thing to contrast this to regarding the last podcast we did of this nature is that in the last podcast solving dry king high boards we did a lot of betting with the overbet size. And the reason we did that was that the calling range just didn't have many good hands in it. The few sets it had were mandatory raises on the flop just to build massive pots and win stacks. Villain doesn't have any hands like that, many hands like that here. He has so many flushes that are not doing fantastically well by check raising flop, blasting turn, shoving river. So they're doing fine. They're probably still qualifying as value bets if we do that with them. But Big Blind is actually going to be slow playing if we can call it that a lot of his flushes here on the flop and that means that we don't just want to unload the clip with overbet overbet when we are the button here and we're barreling turn 
pile is dramatically favouring the bet size of 73 into 50 into 97 here instead of 146. So Pyro is favouring 70% pot on the Deuce of Clubs turn, board being 10 of diamonds, 8 of diamonds, 7 of diamonds, Deuce of Clubs, over the over bet size that would be 1.5 times pot. That 70% is his go-to. Why? Because Big Blind is less capped on this board, he's incentivized to slow play some flushes here. He doesn't slow play sets on the King High dry board and he doesn't have many of them anyway. This is all about the equalization of nut advantage. The fact that this flop gave the big blind loads of hands that were as nutty as many of the hands that we have. That is the reason for our turn sizing being smaller. What are we betting turn with? Well, naturally we're polarizing now. We're betting some over pairs. We're betting some of the best top pair, but not like Pyle's cutoff here for betting for value is ace 10. That's the weakest hand he value bets on the deuce of clubs turn. 10, eight, seven, deuce, three diamonds on the flop, club turn. Because when you start barreling king 10 here and queen 10 and your opponent's already filtered his range by calling you once on the flop, the range that calls you a second time on the turn is going to be doing rather well against you, so you can't really value bet king 10 here, according to Pio. And another problem is that we don't want to bet for protection with king 10 because we've already filtered villain's range on the flop. We don't have the best hand that often now, and we certainly aren't going to be needing to protect anymore against like a random hand like ace three of spades because that folded on the flop if the player was sensible. What are we bluffing with? Well, we're bluffing this three quarter pot size bet now with again some under pair like threes sometimes with some combos of a deuce, like all the ace deuces betting now. It's a five out hand against a hand like 10x, it makes sense. Again, some of the opposite hands that contain diamonds are barreling on the turn like they did on the flop, like king nine. But it may surprise you to know that a lot of other 9x is also betting here, like ace 9 no diamond is betting quite often, king 9 no diamond, queen 9 no diamond, just straight draw hands like that. We're also betting at some small frequency with hands like king queen, with a, a, a high frequency with king queen with a diamond, and we're no longer bluffing, like remember that ace queen off that we bluffed on the flop? Well that didn't really pick up anything, it's now just checking back now and trying to hopefully bink the river or scrape its way to showdown in one piece. So our bluffing range on the turn is a little bit more vanilla, standard, what you're used to. Diamond hands, straight draws, flush draws. The only weird ones are like the pair of deuces and stuff like that. These are hard ones to find, but finding them is going to make you a better balanced player in a tough game because it means that on a diamond river or a nine river or a queen river or something, jack river, you can have absolute air still. Most people will have, they'll be guilty of just having a completely airless range when this board runs out wet on the river. So the reason that Pyle bets some hands like pocket deuces and stuff sorry not pocket deuces that's the set like pocket threes or ace deuce or something is just to make sure that he still has bluffs on some of those wetter rivers when we bet two thirds here for our non over bet because remember over betting is a bad idea when the nut advantage is equalized like this the big blind is going to go ahead and basically meet MDF now folding about 43% of the time that's standard against a three quarter spot size bet that we're using. If you do the math, you'll see that that is about the break-even point for us, is if we get that much fold equity when we're bluffing. Therefore, Villain gives us that much fold equity, no more, no less. Calling again with hands like 10-9, pocket nines, like these pair plus redraw hands, jack 10. Starting to fold some of the 10 that doesn't have a redraw here, like queen 10 and king 10 at some frequency. Starting to fold some of the float hands, like the weaker hands that called flop as well. That could be things like... Um, under pairs that had a diamond and stuff like that these are now going away and villain is going to be raising very infrequently now the only raising that villain does just now and on this node where he's called flop and is now facing the turn barrel is 7.5 percent and it's going to be some of the king high and queen high flushes that slow played the flop balanced with some of the king high and queen high diamond blockers that that called there some sets are also occasionally shoving i don't know how good a play that'll be against pool though it might be overly merged or overly depolarized it might not be good because Pool is very nitty with their bluffing in general. Pool is just like much nittier than Pio and much more unbalanced. When we get to the river, this will be the final thing I talk about for today. Because I need to go eat lunch. It's been a long morning of writing and teaching and stuff. So yeah, we'll talk about the river. Then I'll wrap this one up and come back with another episode of this soon. Different board, of course. So the river is another brick. Let's say the four of spades. Big blind checks. And now we're usually checking back. Many of the hands that we bet twice with, like over pairs, the solver considers too thin to go for another bet with. 
assuming that Big Blind is actually protecting his calling range on the turn with some stronger hands and weak flushes and stuff like that. Against Pool, it's probably more defensible to go for thin value on the river here. Board is 10, 8, 7, deuce, 4, 3 diamonds on the flop, spade and a club. We're checking back aces and kings now, having been called twice. We're checking back queens. We're betting again with mainly flushes and really strong hands like some sets. Um, in fact, even those are, are doing a lot of checking now, actually. Pio just seems to think that ranges should be very, very filtered by this point. More than they are in reality, I would say. That's why the some of the worst value bets we're even making here for the shove size, which is all in, which is like a gigantic size, are flushes. So Pio is basically just mainly using a shove size here, checking back most of the stuff that's not a flush, shoving a flush for like a bazillion times the pot, three times the pot, or whatever. And then having a really high check frequency that's very different to how population will play. For a start, population will not do a lot of jamming here. They will just basically bet underneath the size of the pot because that's what they're used to doing. That's in their little poker thinking box that they have, which is fine. Not everyone's at the level of Pio yet. I don't do enough shoving here either. We are we're all kind of constrained as humans in that sense. We live within these boxes. But the true GTO here, and this is the final revelation for today, is that the button player, the imposition player, should be doing shoving for 3x pot here with nut flushes, king high flushes, queen high flushes, stuff like that. And checking back a lot of stuff that's not a flush. Big blind, when he faces this gigantic colossus shove, it's going to be folding almost 80% of the time. That's normal. We're risking three times the pot. He can fold a lot. And yeah, he's calling us down when he has stuff like a straight with a diamond blocker or one of the flushes that he slow played and just folding all the pairs and stuff like that. So I hope you guys enjoyed that analysis of 1087. It's very, very different from the board we looked at before. Book report, I am almost there with Poker Therapy, my mental game slash rewiring your mind for poker type of book. I think it's going to really improve the win rate of many players out there. I think it's going to clear up a lot of the stuff that's a little non-technical, that's more like mental game leaks. Not necessarily raging tilt, but just mental game leaks that people are suffering from. Um, and I think it's going to add a lot to your game, basically. It should be an enjoyable read as well. I've written it in that kind of way. Stay tuned for a podcast in the next couple of weeks that actually is the official release podcast for Poker Therapy with a little extract and a little discussion about it that's coming up. I may get a student on the show to go through the bit of the book with me. And that book will be available on the store at carrotcorner.com. In the meantime, do check out The Grounders Manual, my first book, 100 Hands, my second book, Pio vs. Population, which if you enjoyed today's podcast, you will love. It's the same thing, but in like an e-magazine format. Go ahead, buy those, let me know what you think of them. Um, and I'll be back in a week or so with another podcast hope you guys are enjoying the series also get in touch if you want to be on the podcast I can always use guests get in touch if you want coaching you can email me admin at caratcorner.com or add me to Skype as characters if you think you've got something a little bit unique or interesting to talk about um, with respect to your poker journey I'd love to have you on the show about time we had another guest on so thanks for watching listening driving whatever you're doing and I'll speak to you guys soon Bye-bye for now.